Welcome friends. In my last video, I spoke to you about Paul's background and uh, I discussed with you about Paul's transcultural hybrid identity. Now when we have discussed that as Paul's transcultural hybrid identity, now it is the time for us to go into the next stage of Pauline discussion. That is on Paul's chronology of life. Now this is one of the most difficult and uh, complicated topic uh, which scholars on which scholars take uh, you no know, variety of positions and those the positions that you take on one or the other small small or major discussions and debates that are going on in Pauline studies that will uh, make a lot of difference how you reconstruct uh, Paul's chronology of life. As I'm going to talk to you about the chronology of Paul's life now, I'm not going to deal with all the different opinions that are aired in Pauline studies. Rather, I would try to focus on the more important ones in my discussion. And uh, in between, I will try to reconstruct the chronology of Paul based on what positions do I take in my um, reconstruction of Paul's theology and his life. Even before we move into a detailed discussion on Paul's life and the chronology, one thing we need to understand is um, why it is so important for us to reconstruct Paul's um, order of Paul's life events. Um, I will give start with two very simple uh, points that are very important for us to remember. The first reason why I think chronology of Paul must be understood properly uh, to some extent right in the beginning of one's introduction into Pauline studies is that number one um, it will help the student or a, a student of Paul to understand Paul's mind and the development of thought that is that was taking place in him now some have taken Paul as a person who received the uh, crux of his theology right at the time of his conversion and over the years as he went around doing mission it was for some it is just unraveling of the seed of the gospel that he received on the way to Damascus. Nevertheless, um, I, I personally think Paul as a normal human being uh, did receive that uh, the essence of the gospel on the way to Damascus. However, as he moved into his missionary career from place to place um, as he encountered more issues you know his thoughts were getting refined his understanding of Christ as he understood from the beginning of his conversion time to the later point in his life we can see some sort of development or systematization certain positions on certain things for example on eschatology and the return of Christ as Paul appears to have held in the beginning uh, doesn't seem to be so towards the end of his life. Paul seems to have refined his thinking, thought through more about some of the practical issues and have has come to more reasonable conclusions towards the end. Um, and it is informed by his life reality. Now some of the scholars have tried to reconstruct Paul's chronology of life based on uh, the um, theological development of Paul's mind in Paul's letters. That is one way of constructing uh, Paul's life from his letters. However, I don't think that is the best way to do that. Rather, the best way would be to go and look for historical events directly, indirectly alluded or mentioned in Paul's letters and then to connect them with the um, extra biblical historical sources of the first century and then to see where does Paul's life, um, how does Paul's, Paul's life pan out uh, during the uh, middle part of the first century. Uh, so that is why I will not be going from theological thinking of Paul to reconstruct chrono chronology of life. Rather, I would be going on the reverse order to see the chronological framework of Paul's life based on the historical evidences that we have 
From there we will move and probably as much as possible in this video we will try to understand some of the basic elements of the uh, development of Paul's theology in from the beginning letters to the uh, some of the last letters that Paul must have written. The second important reason why we must understand Paul's chronology of life is because it helps us in interpreting Paul's letters. How do we order his letters in different um, sequences uh, depending upon the positions that we take on um, various issues that arise in Pauline discussion. Um, you know, our ordering can change. For example, for some when Galatians is a later letter written somewhere closer to 2 Corinthians when Paul wrote it. Um, I would contend that Paul's uh, Galatians was Paul's one of the earliest written letter written along with 1 Thessalonians or possibly even with the 2 Thessalonians if Paul wrote that. Uh, so this is what I'm trying to say that as the position that you take on each small issues, it will help in your interpretation. Even the eschatological thought, uh, no, even the development of uh, Paul's teachings about eschatology, the last days, and how much it should be found in each letter, also can be understood based on the way that one develops this order of events in Paul's life. So these are the main two reasons why I think every Pauline, stu every student of Paul must um, seriously undertake in the right in the beginning of um, the study life itself to understand the chronology of Paul and slowly as one moves into a more um, higher education and uh, moves uh, um, deeper into the study of Paul uh, the student must keep building up uh, this order that one finds more logical to oneself based on the evidences that we have. Now, this leads us to a first and the more important, most important uh, beginning point for us. How shall we reconstruct the chronology of Paul's life? Uh, what are the sources for us to do that? Traditionally, um, New Testament scholars in the past have taken Acts of the Apostles as the only uh, book of history in the New Testament more seriously and try to reconstruct Paul's life out of that. Um, so Lucan testimony or the description of Paul's life and his mission journeys play primary role in such reconstructions. If Acts of the Apostles is taken as the basis then uh, Luke's testimony is more important to reconstruct Paul's life. The second source is Paul's letters. Now, uh, in the recent scholarship or in the modern scholarship, scholars have thought it is much more reasonable and logical to prioritize Paul's letters over Lucan testimony in Acts of the Apostles as the primary source of reconstructing Paul's life. Um, but the, risk, the challenge is that in Paul's letters, he doesn't speak chronologically uh, the events about his life as Luke would give. So the task is difficult to reconstruct chronology of Paul's life based on uh, acts of the, uh, based on Paul's letters. However, I personally am convinced along with many other scholars that probably the best way to begin reconstructing Paul's chronology is to look for his own testimony about his life. How does he explain events in his own letters? So um, two ways as I mentioned Acts of the Apostles could be one source for some that he, in the past that is the primary source to begin with uh, reconstructing uh, to begin reconstructing Paul's life yet for some others in the modern studies and many scholars are moving into that direction that Paul's letters become the primary source of reconstructing Paul's life. If so, um, in that class also, if we emphasize, if, if so, uh, that if so that we take Paul's letters as the primary source of reconstructing Paul's life, then again we need to prioritize certain letters uh, within the uh, Pauline corpus, what we call 13 letters of Paul. 
we would prioritize the undisputed letters of Paul, his testimony in those letters uh, over the disputed letters of Paul, for example, pastoral epistles or Colossians or Ephesians. And we would prioritize the data that we get from Galatians, Corinthians and other letters or Romans that we get. We would prioritize that over the disputed letters of Paul in reconstructing the chronology of Paul's life. Um, you will be able to edit in between all this. So in our discussion in this video, I would lean towards Paul's letters as the preferred basis of reconstructing Paul's life and then value look and testimony about Paul's life only to substitute um, or to add additional information about those events into Paul's data that he provides us. So where should we begin? Where should we begin? Um, the first thing that we need to remember is that whether it is Acts of the Apostles or um, is Paul's own letters, Luke and Paul both are in agreement of one truth that Paul's conversion followed Jesus' uh, crucifixion, death, resurrection and even the uh, event of Pentecost as described in Acts chapter 2. Because in Galatians 1, Paul calls himself as the one who was already moving out into Gentile areas to persecute Christians. So that means by now Christians had slowly spread to some places and um, obviously that growth of Christianity, geographical growth of Christianity is now happening um, after a couple of years later on. So first fact we accept is that Paul's uh, conversion in Acts chapter 9 is happening only after the, uh, the event of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2 and Luke, uh, Paul himself agrees with that. So both the witnesses are agreeing on this fact. Uh, who was Paul? As I described in my previous video, Paul is a transcultural hybrid Jew who is ethnically a Jew but then he lived a life between the uh, cultures in such a natural manner that you cannot uh, call him sometime a Jew, sometime a Gentile. Rather, he imbibed the Hellenistic, Roman and Jewish um, identity so naturally in him that uh, now Paul moves around in this Roman imperial world with a lot of freedom, without artificiality, and he finds himself comfortable in this world, uh, in, the, in his own Greco-Roman world. Um, and Galatians chapter 1 uh, mentions in verse 13, Paul says that he was the persecutor of the church, um, which he coincides with Luke's testimony in Acts chapter 7, in the instance of uh, Saul, uh, you know, giving leadership in uh, stoning Stephen to death. So both the places, it is very clear that whether Luke or Acts you take, this is a unanimous testimony about Paul's life, that Paul was the persecutor of Christians in the early stages of life. Now here, Luke, Paul does not mention that he was a young man in Galatians chapter 1, but this is where the additional information that Luke gives in chapter 7 uh, becomes very important for us. If he was leading the mob, in stoning Stephen to death, then he must have been an adult by now already. He was young enough to take the mob into confidence and lead the mob to lynch Stephen. Okay, so this is the best evidence for us to begin and say that yes, now we are talking about an uh, adult person who is now. Um, accepted in the society as grown up and mature 
to give leadership and others could look up to him as a person who is uh, reliable in uh, you know leading them into certain actions in the social life now if that is the case the parallel incident that we need to understand is that if Jesus's crucifixion death and resurrection happened in AD 30 now there are scholars who would say that AD 33 should be the date of uh, crucifixion now and resurrection possible that is uh, but due to certain calculation differences there are others opinions also some would place it around 28 to 29 uh, I prefer to tentatively place it as AD 30 as Jesus's uh, crucifixion and resurrection and 33 maybe some others scholars who would prefer to date as Jesus's crucifixion but for our discussion we will agree upon the fact that AD 30 could be the time when uh, Jesus was crucified and he resurrected and he ascended if so just 50 days later Acts chapter 2 the incident of the event of Pentecost takes place so that means AD 30 becomes very important for us if, if AD 30 is important to decide about the, uh, the death of Jesus, resurrection of Jesus and ascension of Jesus and the birth of the church in Acts chapter 2. If AD 30 is that date, how much long period of time it must have taken to come up to Acts chapter 9 to say that Paul's conversion took place. On this date or in this year that is a disputed uh, date altogether how much time it must have taken uh, we do not know uh, but um, I uh, while those who date it around 33 Jesus's death and resurrection would say maybe one or two years it may take from Acts chapter 2 for the story to move up to Acts chapter 9 um, well I would uh, think that probably it can be three to four years uh, taking because now gospel had to be preached in Jerusalem, Judea and now uh, Philip comes into the scene and Christianity or the Christian faith is now moving out of uh, the Judean boundary into Samaria, uh, Joppa and other places. So now the, the Christian missionaries are becoming active. So it must have taken three to four years roughly speaking. Um, so that means um, if you give that means if you give around four years of time so it must bring us to somewhere around AD 34 for us to say okay according to Luke, Luke and testimony in Acts chapter 9 probably Acts chapter 9 the incident of Paul's conversion on the way to Damascus must have happened in AD 34 now I said that we would be reconstructing Paul's life uh, as much as possible based on Paul's letters. So where should we begin then? I feel that we must begin based on Paul's own testimony uh, from um, one particular incident that is mentioned in both the um, biblical account as well as in uh, secular history. Acts chapter 18 mentions about Galio. Uh, now Galio is also mentioned in the inscription of Delphi and most probably Galio started his governorship somewhere around AD 51, late 51 or early 52. Uh, if so, then by this time Paul had reached in Corinth during his second missionary journey. So if you give around two or three years of time for Paul to move from Antioch after the Jerusalem Council and then to reach up to Corinth after preaching in Galatia and other places, if you give two to three years, then that means you will come somewhere at AD 48 of late 48 or 49 as the date for Jerusalem Council. Uh, Acts chapter 15 uh, speaks about um, 
Jerusalem council and the reference to that we also find in Galatians chapter 1 verses 1 to 10. Now the question is, where does it leave us? If Galatians 1, 1 to 10 is speaking about the, his visit for Jerusalem council as Luke mentions in Acts chapter 15, then Paul leaves two important pointers there. He says that after 14 years, in, Gal in Galatians chapter 2 verse 1, he says, after 14 years, I went back to Jerusalem. How do you calculate these 14 years? We said AD 49 may be the time when Jerusalem council or Galatians chapter 1 verses 1 to 10 incident must have taken place. AD 49. If so, if Paul reached Jerusalem after 14 years back to AD late 34 or 35 as the date to Paul's conversion as Luke mentions in Acts chapter 9. Okay. Um, earlier we discussed that Jesus' crucifixion, death and resurrection, we dated around AD 30. You remember that? And then we said maybe three to four years it may have taken for Paul's conversion to happen in Acts chapter 9. So that leaves us somewhere around AD 34. We left it there. We came back to Paul's own testimony and we said Galatians chapter um, 2 verses 1 to 10. If it is the same incident as Acts chapter 15 speaks about Jerusalem council, then Paul's own testimony says that after 14 years, he went back to Jerusalem. Okay, so that means Paul's conversion must have happened somewhere in AD 35 or 34, late 34 or 35. Now this is again disputed. It depends upon how do you calculate those 14 years. In chapter 1, Paul says, Galatians chapter 1, Paul says that he went after his conversion on the way to Damascus, he went into Arabia for three years and then he came back to Damascus for the second time. And then he says in chapter 2, verse 1, after 14 years, how do you calculate this 14? There are two ways of calculating. One we call consecutive calculation. That means three years in Arabia plus 14 years, as he mentions in Galatians 2 1, that gives us 17 years. Okay. The second way of doing is calculation is concurrent calculation. That means Three years in Arabia, the ministry that he did is included in these 14 years that he mentions in Galatians chapter 2 verse 1. That means it is 3 plus 11 only we will take if it is concurrent. So it gives us 14 years. So concurrent calculation will give us 14 years from Jerusalem council to calculate Paul's conversion. If it is consecutive, then from Jerusalem Council, it can give us up to 17 years to bring it forward. David Benham would say that Paul probably was converted in 32 or 33. That is because he calculates 17 years consecutively from AD 49 to 17 years to 32 or 33. But there are other scholars who calculate in, a consecu uh, in consecutive form only, but they calculate from 35 as the conversion and would put Jerusalem council somewhere around 51. But this uh, calculation of putting Jerusalem council in AD 51 is not accepted generally. Generally in Pauline studies, the position the scholars have taken is AD 49 is the Jerusalem council. So in that calculation, Consecutive calculation according to as David Benham would say would be placed as 32 or 33 if consecutive calculation is taken. But if people like us including me who calculate it as concurrent would calculate not as 17 but 14 years. So AD 49 to 14 years backward somewhere around AD 39 was Paul converted. This is also supported by Luke's testimony about a particular incident that took place. He says that Paul escaped 
from Damascus during the time of Ethnarch of King Aretas. Um, he escaped in the basket. You may remember that incident. He, uh, Paul also mentions that. Paul mentions that in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 33. If so, history tells us that Aretas may not have gained uh, control over this region before AD 37. And somewhere around between 38 and 40, Aretas died. So that means we have very less period of time reliably to say 37 to 38 could be the date when Paul escaped from Damascus in basket. So if 38 is the time when Paul escaped dramatically from Damascus, then it gives us, we should calculate three years backward to again fix the date and we get again AD 35 as the date of Paul's conversion. Okay, so now this is how historically we have placed it. We talked first about Gallio, who ruled between 51 52, whose name is mentioned even in secular history, and Paul reaches in Corinth during that time and giving two or three years for Paul to travel. We calculate that AD 49 could be the time when uh, Jerusalem Council took place. Okay. Then calculating backward, we come concurrently calculating 14 years, we come to 35, AD 35 as the time when Paul was converted. Now this date, we keep it in our mind and then we go to another date, another incident that Paul mentions about um, escape from Damascus during the time of the, um, the ethnarch of the king of uh, Aretas, you know, so that is in 38, then three years backwards. So 35 more or less comes like a date for us to depend and say that somewhere around AD 35 that Paul was converted. Okay, so these are the dates AD 35 conversion, AD 49 as Jerusalem Council, AD 51 or 52, he was in Corinth already. Okay, late 51 or early 52, he was already in Corinth when he meets Priscilla and Aquila in Acts chapter 18. Okay, that's the place. Then another important point that we have to remember from, Paul, uh, from the historical data is uh, Paul's arrest, which Luke mentions. That is somewhere around uh, 59 we should place because that was the time when uh, Festus took up governorship from Felix and Paul was undergoing already trial in Jerusalem and Felix transfers his case to Festus and by this time Paul had already appealed to go to Caesar and appear before Caesar in Rome so um, 59 could be that date okay so 59 so these are the three important dates that we can uh, place for our so three or four important dates I repeat again for your sake, uh, 35 as conversion point, date, 38 as the incident of Ethnarch, uh, the king of Aretas mentioned, and then we come to um, AD 49, when Jerusalem council can be reliably dated, and then uh, Festus and Felix transfer of power happening somewhere closer to um, 59. Okay, 8059. Keeping that date. Now let us work out Paul's journey. If 35 was Paul's conversion, according to his own testimony in Galatians 1.16, then for three years he was in Arabia. Okay, and he comes back to Damascus. In Galatians 11, 16 and 17, he mentions that. So three year in Arabia experience. He comes back and that's the time he escapes Galatians 1 17 uh, and which he uh, mentions again in 2nd Corinthians 11 32 and 33 okay then from there we need to decide that uh, Paul goes for his mission journey to 
Cilicia and Syria. Okay, that is maybe as his first missionary journey that Paul did before the Jerusalem Council took place. Remember the first missionary journey, he comes down to the island and uh, Miletus and then he goes up. He goes up to the southern Asia Minor region. He works in the region of Galatia, Lystra, Derbe, Iconium uh, and Physidian Antioch and then he returns back and then comes to Antioch and then goes back. Then he goes to Jerusalem for the council, Acts chapter 15. Okay, so that must be somewhere around 44 or 45 or even 46 to let's keep say it as 46 to 48 could be the time when he went around in southern part of Asia Minor, Galatian region, South Galatian region, did his ministry and he comes back uh, to Jerusalem for the council meeting. Okay, so council we said AD 49, let's keep as a date for us to remember easily. Um, Galatians chapter 2 verses 1 to 10 testify about it and it is the same incident I believe is mentioned in Acts chapter 15. Then Paul, the, after the decision is taken, Paul comes back to uh, Antioch and that is where the problem between Paul and Peter takes place. Galatians chapter 2 verses 11 to 14 mentions about this incident that uh, Peter was already there um, and he, he was having food with the Gentiles and as he hears and comes to know that some have come from Jerusalem to spy, Peter is afraid, scared and he gets up and separates himself from the table fellowship of the Gentiles and there Paul confronts him uh, and says that this is not the right way that one must conduct and then you know that whole discussion we should understand in Galatians. Um, so after that Paul moves into his second missionary journey immediately after that so it could be possible that in 49 towards the end somewhere in 49 itself uh, this Antiochian incident took place of confronting Peter and Paul's and Paul undertakes his second missionary journey he moves goes up to Cilicia and then he visits the earlier churches that he founded during his first missionary journey he wants to go up towards the north towards Bithynia Spirit stops, Holy Spirit stops him he wants to go down to Messiah Holy Spirit again stops him so he goes up to Troas and he waits there and that is where now uh, the Holy Spirit gives him what we call the Macedonian call and first transcontinental mission of Paul happens here First time Christianity moves from Asia to Europe. He moves from there and probably he first ministered in Philippi and then he does in Thessalonica and then you know towards down he moves preaching the gospel, Achaia, Athens and other places he preaches and comes to Corinth. So those all incidents we can put between AD 50, uh, 49 after Jerusalem Council. If you start from Antioch incident onwards then 49 end to maybe 52 and when he comes to Corinth in towards the end of 51 or early 52 he finds Priscilla and Aquila there already okay who were sent out by the decree of Emperor Claudius and he travels they travel from there and they come and meet Paul in Corinth and that was a meeting from where um, you know a very productive mission takes place uh, in Corinth itself and Priscilla and Aquila's role we understand it very well from um, Luke and testimony and then after that Paul quickly moves to Miletus and from there he down comes down straight to Jerusalem he comes and reports and then he immediately starts his third missionary journey what we call it. he goes up to Antioch again and then he moves again up goes up again visits the entire he goes to Ephesus and from there Ephesus again he moves into the Macedonian region comes back to Corinth, he stays there and does ministry and he goes back again. If you have the map behind the Bible, you can check that. He goes up and comes down to uh, near um, Ephesus, calls his uh, elders in the church in Ephesus at Miletus, gives them a lecture and this, uh, prays for them and then he comes down to Jerusalem and he arrested. Now this third missionary journey can be placed somewhere between 53 
to 58 probably 58 he comes back to Jerusalem he's arrested and then the whole proceeding starts in Jerusalem um, the long battle happens there uh, in the court Paul's defense of himself uh, before Agrippa and all those incidences that Luke mentions happens and in 59 as I mentioned earlier the transfer of power from Felix to Festus happens Festus becomes the new governor and Festus says that had he not appealed to Caesar already he could have been left free but then Paul had appealed so Festus sends him to Rome so probably in 58 he was arrested 59 Festus comes and takes charge and his journey starts towards Rome somewhere probably we can say around 60 they reach in Rome and this is where Acts of the Apostles comes to an end Acts 28 mentions that Paul reached Rome and he stayed there for two years so in house arrest so from 60 if you give two years more to 62 then probably that was the time when Paul was there in Rome now many of the scholars who think that this should be the end of Paul's life they will say that you know where Acts of the Apostle finishes that's where the story of Paul also comes to an end so probably in AD 60 he was executed uh, but there is a strong tradition um, from Clement of Rome that when Paul, as Paul desired in Romans chapter 15 to go further to Spain and preach and he expected the church in Rome to give him support. When Paul reached in Rome, he remained in house arrest for two more years. So that means 60, he reached in Rome up to 62, he stayed in Rome in house arrest and then he was freed. He goes up into Spain to preach and again he was arrested from there so the first time when he was in Rome between AD 60 to 62 we call it first imprisonment and then he goes up to Spain to preach he's arrested there he he's brought back around 64 or 65 he's in Rome that is what we call a second imprisonment of Paul in Rome and during this time Paul as the test, um, church tradition says during the persecution of Nero after the burning of Rome that Peter and Paul were martyred then if that is the case we must date Paul's death somewhere around 65 or 66 uh, I personally hold on to the second imprisonment theory um, and in my future lectures also as I develop I will be keeping uh, Paul's letters to some of these this reconstruction of Paul's chronology um, so I would put in this way now having come up to the death of Paul in speaking broadly the dates of Paul's journey and other details as we know let us quickly place some of these letters in these years traditionally it has been accepted that first Thessalonians is the first letter of Paul I think that can be kept as it is although some would say no not necessary it should be the first it could be it could be one of the first letters possible whatever it is I keep uh, first Thessalonians um, as the first letter of Paul and Galatians as one of the first letters of Paul so I would place Galatians between AD 50 and 51 along with first Thessalonians uh, I personally subscribe to the view that uh, second Thessalonians is Paul's letter in that case Paul wrote first Thessalonians first somewhere in AD 50 and then very quickly within very very short time he writes his second letter and between this period only he writes letter to the Galatians also um, okay so somewhere between 50 and 51 um, uh, towards the end of 51 Paul must have written by now first Thessalonians second Thessalonians and um, Galatians then we come to Corinthians which Paul must have written if multiple uh, letters are found in 1st and 2nd Corinthians then we will have a different dates and different places to mention let us broadly for time being say that between 53 to 55 or 56 Paul wrote 1st Corinthians 2nd Corinthians and Romans towards the end 56 or something like that um, but those who will say no Galatians was written later would put during this time somewhere around 55 56 55 along with 2nd Corinthians they will put Galatians I do not do that I place it early um, then um, if Philippians is a prison letter 
and if it was uh, uh, written from jail then I think the best uh, choice would be to put Philippians uh, in the Roman imprisonment time that is the first imprisonment somewhere around uh, AD 60 and 61 Paul must have uh, written Philippians and uh, then uh, Philemon also during that time and then he goes to Spain for his mission work he comes back arrested he comes back to Rome he stays there and probably that's the time when he wrote uh, his pastoral epistles where to put Ephesians and Colossians um, we would have to place it early uh, probably you know, during his um, time in Rome or if other theories are taken other places are suggested then it will be even before that or if those who doubt uh, that it is uh, Paul's authorship of Ephesians and Colossians uh, would even in fact will not place it anywhere in his lifespan and will say that it was written sometime later uh, friends I believe this broad discussion on the chronology of Paul's life uh, would make some things clear to you um, as you try to understand Paul better the chronology of Paul's life is not the important thing in Pauline discussion but it is a very important component for a beginner uh, to get clear and start taking positions based on a lot of study and uh, facts understanding that because that will decide how he will or one will uh, try to interpret Paul's letters and as I wind up my discussion with you on the chronology of Paul's life my prayer would be to all the students who would be listening to me uh, my prayer is that may the Lord grant you the grace to um, understand these complex dates and issues that are discussed among scholars and come to a right position so that you would be able to think through various issues debated in Pauline studies and you would be able to understand Paul uh, better and God's revelation that comes to us through Paul's life. Thank you.